Located in Seattle, Washington, along the traffic-ridden I-5, the Hotel Vintage Park is a location that lives up to its namesake. With a classic boutique look, the Hotel Vintage Park, now known as the Kimpton Hotel Vintage, has long shared a building with the ritzy Tulio Ristorante and is within walking distance of Seattle's many tourist attractions, including the Space Needle, Pike Place Market, the Seattle Aquarium and Art Museum, and even the infamous Gum Wall. To many, the Hotel Vintage Park is the perfect place to stay when you're visiting Seattle for either business or pleasure. For one woman, however, this was the place where her life's story came to a tragic and mystifying end. This is the story of Mary A. Anderson. On Wednesday, October 9th, 1996, an unusually warm fall day in the Seattle area, with temperatures reaching 80 degrees, a woman phoned into the Hotel Vintage Park, hoping to make a reservation for the next two days. About 90 minutes later, the woman arrived via cab, carrying two bags with her. She spoke to an attendant at the front desk and paid cash for her two-night stay, booking a superior guest room which cost approximately $149 each night. In total, she paid about $350 in cash. During check-in, this woman used the name Mary A. Anderson to identify herself. When asked to provide an address and phone number, she did so, listing her address as 132 East 3rd Street, New York, New York, 11103, and her phone number as 212 569 5549. Unfortunately, none of these identifiers were real. While the zip and area codes used in the address and phone number matched up with legitimate areas from New York, from Queens and Manhattan, respectively. They did not match up with the address and phone number that this woman provided. While this indicated some familiarity with the New York City area, neither of these two were legitimate. But the staff at the hotel had no reason to suspect otherwise at the time, since this information was only used to verify identities later on. This woman would scratch her name with the hotel register, writing Mary Anderson, while checking into her room room 214, which the hotel had provided to her since it was available at the time. Later on, authorities would note hesitation marks in the woman's handwriting, which led them to believe that the name wasn't real at all. Most likely, this woman had refrained from instinctively writing her own name and had come up with this identity, Mary Anderson, on the spot. During her two days there, the woman in room 214, who identified herself as Mary Anderson, had not spoken with or interacted with any of the staff. Two days later, on Friday, October 11th, 1996, staff at the Hotel Vintage Park would note that this guest had exceeded her stay and had not called in with them to extend it before her checkout time. A staff member was sent to check in with the woman in her room and made note of the Do Not Disturb sign on the door, which she had placed on the handle shortly after her arrival. This bellhop would attempt to enter her room, but noticed that the deadbolt was secure from inside, indicating that someone was still in the room. Staff members of the hotel would enter the room, and discovered the woman reclining on the bed, laying on top of the sheets propped up by several pillows. She was wearing all black clothing and pink lipstick, and almost appeared to have fallen asleep while reading a book. On top of her chest was a large black King James Bible, which was open to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The woman, laying on her back with her neck propped up and arms resting beside her, looked peaceful, serene even. To the staff members that initially entered the hotel room, she looked like she had simply fallen asleep. However, a quick check of her pulse revealed that this was not the case. Sadly, the woman was no longer alive. A drinking glass next to the woman, resting innocently on a nightstand next to the bed, would later reveal the reason for her death cyanide, which she had seemingly consumed of her own volition. On the bedside table, next to the glass containing cyanide residue, was a note that the woman had written on hotel stationery. To whom it may concern, I have decided to end my life and no one is responsible for my death. Mary Anderson. P.S. I have no relatives, you can use my body as you choose. Authorities were called to the hotel and observed that the woman's room appeared to have been kept neat and orderly, not scattered or messy, as you would expect. As you'd imagine, attempts to locate this woman's next of kin were stymied by the information that she had left behind. Investigators would quickly learn that the name she had provided to the front desk, Mary A. Anderson, was not her real name and that the address and phone number she had provided were not legitimate, despite the information within them revealing an apparent affinity for the boroughs of New York City. A search of the woman's hotel room would reveal that she had gone through great lengths to hide her actual identity. At the time of her death, she had no forms of identification on her, and had destroyed items in her possession that might have indicated her true name, such as labels on prescription pill bottles and things like that. The King County Medical Examiner's Office would handle the autopsy of this woman's remains and the investigation into the mysterious circumstances of her death, later detailing in their official report that she had killed herself through a lethal cocktail of metamucil and cyanide. Because of the usage of cyanide, the woman's facial features may have been distorted after death, but it was believed that she was somewhere between her mid-30s and early 50s. More specifically, between 33 and 45 years old, but likely on the higher end of that spectrum. Before this woman decided to take her own life, she had gone through the effort of ensuring that she was well-groomed, with the ME's report noting that her nails were well-manicured and painted a cream-white color. Her eyebrows were neatly plucked, her ears were pierced, and she had put on a fresh coat of makeup before ingesting cyanide. Makeup that made her appear several years older than she actually was. She also had some crooked front teeth, but otherwise, her teeth appeared to be in perfect condition. She stood about 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighed approximately 240 pounds, had neatly combed auburn hair and brown eyes. While she might have colored or treated her hair sometime before her death, this auburn color was her most likely natural hair. Hair color. Meanwhile, it's worth noting that light eyes tend to darken after death, so it's unknown if that happened here, turning this woman's eyes darker brown, or if they had been that dark throughout her life. At the time of this woman's death, she still had a copper IUD inserted, but unfortunately the serial number had worn off with time. Authorities would attempt to track down where she had received the IUD through a specific part number, but discovered that it matched thousands of similar devices sold all over the U.S., so finding a specific match would be like finding a needle in a haystack. During the woman's autopsy, it was noted that she appeared to have had bilateral breast surgery at some point, which left scars beneath both breast and near her nipples. While some theorized that she might have had breast cancer, these scars most likely came from cosmetic surgery of some kind, most likely breast reduction surgery. Other than consuming the cyanide that had ended her life, this woman appeared to be in good health otherwise, and appeared to have never given birth. During her two-day stay at the Hotel Vintage Park, no one had seen this woman leave her hotel room. She had not ordered room service, had not made a peep during her stay, and had not even used her hotel phone to make any calls. Staff members that had interacted with this woman during her stay at the hotel, namely during her check-in, reported learning very little about her, indicating that she had no discernible accent during her limited interactions with anyone there. Most people in Washington state have an accent like mine, 
which some perceive to be a normal, quote-unquote, American accent, but I've always thought to be more specific to the West Coast. That's just my own two cents, though, and not at all indicative of this case. Regardless, the people at the hotel did not pick up on an accent from this woman, which makes me believe that she came from this region. To everyone involved in this case, it seems like this woman had gone through the effort of taking her own life as anonymously as possible and whatever answers she may have provided to the authorities that found her and attempted to track down her next of kin, she took with her to the grave. Early on, authorities believed this to be a rather simple case of suicide, as brash and uncouth as that is to say, as recounted by former chief investigator for the King County Medical Examiner's Office, Jerry Webster, during one of the several interviews he gave about this case. He believed that this case would be pushed through his department in no more than 20 minutes after making a couple of phone calls. However, this was not the case, as has been proven over the years, with Webster remarking to the Seattle Post-Intelligencer in 2005. It didn't appear to be a complex case, or a difficult one. Then things started to go wrong. Authorities attempted to identify the woman repeatedly, submitting her fingerprints to state, federal, and international databases through FBI and Interpol. They then attempted to match her identity with missing person reports filed throughout North America, not only in the US but also in Canada, attempting to match up this mysterious woman to missing girls and women sought after by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. After comparing this woman to thousands of missing persons all over the Western Hemisphere, authorities were unable to find a match. The specificities of her case ruled out almost every other possibility. Whoever this woman was, she had left behind no breadcrumbs that could lead back to wherever she had called home. Despite her apparent links to New York City, authorities believed her home to be in the Seattle area, which is why she had likely chosen to end her life there. Attempts were made to trace her belongings, but were similarly unsuccessful. A search of the woman's hotel room revealed a trove of personal possessions, but the woman had done a good job of removing any potential identifiers from each one. This list of items included two luggage bags, which had no tags, black leggings and a black top, which she was wearing at the time of her death, six stretch velour outfits of various colors, which were found hanging up in the hotel closet, various shoes and slippers, which all seemed to be a woman's size 10, a cobalt blue Himalaya outfitter's jacket, black leather gloves from Nordstrom, an olive green leather purse, which contained $36.78 in cash, but no credit or debit cards, nor ID cards of any kind, toothpaste and other toiletries, high-end makeup and perfume, Metamucil, which she had mixed with cyanide, crystal light drink mix, pantyhose, a kitchen bowl, and an iron. Authorities would even note that before her death, this woman had gone through the extra step of removing a dental plate, which might have helped identify her remains. This dental plate, which indicated some significant prior dental work, was nowhere to be found at the scene. Attempts were even made to trace the cyanide that the woman had used to take her life, but these too were fruitless. The usage of cyanide, an incredibly tough substance to obtain for anyone not in the mining or jewelry business, confirmed that this woman was indeed looking to take her own life. Unlike some other suicide attempts, which may have been desperate pleas for help, the usage of cyanide indicated that this woman had thoroughly considered her options, and had gone through the effort of hiding her identity from authorities. M. Arley, a member of the King County Medical Examiner's Office, later told reporters with the Associated Press, She did one of the most thorough jobs of obliterating her ID that I have ever seen in my career. She could have taught the FBI tricks. Over the past 25 years, Investigators, journalists, and web sleuths alike have tried to dig into the details to figure out this mysterious woman's identity, but all have been left similarly empty-handed. This has resulted in a wide net of theories and rumors, none of which have proven to be the key needed to crack this case. One of the theories linked to this story is the belief that Mary Anderson had picked the hotel room she took her life in specifically for that purpose. 
while it is possible that she may have stayed at the Hotel Vintage Park before her suicide, and the hotel itself may have held some significance in her life, none of the hotel staff recognized her from prior stays. Also, it's worth noting that she did not pick room 214. Rather, she had called to make the reservation approximately 90 minutes before checking in, and had then been assigned the room randomly by the staff, simply because it was available. So it's not believed that this room held any personal or emotional significance for her. Another widespread belief in this case is that Mary Anderson must have been a religious person, perhaps a member of a church or religious organization. After all, at the time of her death, she left a King James Bible open to a specific passage, Psalm 23, and this was one of the few clues left behind at the scene. Personally, I believe that she might have been raised religious, but since she chose to end her own life, which is heavily frowned upon by most branches of Christianity, to me this indicates that she was only somewhat religious. She was likely not dogmatic to the point of it ruling her life. Instead, she might have just turned to religion in a moment of need, her final moments alive. Many in the online community believe that this woman might have worked for a scientific lab or a mining or jewelry company of some kind, which would explain how she was able to get her hands on cyanide. After all, the compound is pretty hard to track down since it is so heavily regulated, but involvement in or a connection to those fields would explain how she was able to obtain some. This is still a popular and credible theory in the case, despite investigators being unable to track down a link to any of these industries. Other theories in this case vary between the unlikely to the improbable. Some believe that this woman was murdered, killed by someone else, and made to look like a suicide. There is almost no evidence to support this, as no one was reported to go in or out of the woman's room during her two-day stay at the Seattle-based hotel. The crime scene was calm and organized, not messy and chaotic, as you would expect from any murder scene. Needless to say, this is a theory that's posited in search of evidence to back it up, not the other way around. Some believe that this woman might have been a spy of some kind, which would explain why her identity has been so hard to determine after all these years. Because she appeared to look vaguely Eastern European, this theory seems to hold some water with internet commenters, but again, there exists very little evidence to back it up, other than her thoroughly destroying any record of her identity, which seems almost impossible to do decades later. However, the woman's command of the English language and her lack of any noticeable accent among those that interacted with her seems to downplay that possibility. Many liken this story to that of Jennifer Fairgate, the woman that killed herself in Oslo, Norway under similarly suspicious circumstances in 1995, and whose story was recently featured on the Netflix reboot of Unsolved Mysteries. Others compared this story to the suicide of Lyle Stevick, the man that killed himself in 2001 in a hotel in Amanda Park, Washington, not too far away from where Mary Anderson met the same fate. However, unlike this woman, the identity of Lyle Stevick has been determined after so many years. Despite writing in her suicide note that I have no relatives, or I have no relations, based on the source, authorities believe that this wasn't true, because she also wrote that no one is responsible for my death. It's believed that this mysterious woman may have been attempting to help someone else move on should they have learned about her taking her own life. Also, her ending the note with the postscript, you can use my body as you wish, might have been her attempting to prevent her loved ones from having to deal with the after effects of her suicide. Her stripping her body of any identity may have played a significant part in that. M. Arley, a member of the King County Medical Examiner's Office, told reporters with the Associated Press years ago, that's a clue that she did have someone, and she didn't want them to know. Speaking to the Seattle PI in 2005, Jerry Webster, the former chief investigator for the King County ME's office, recalled, I'm convinced she left us clues to who she was, and we missed them. The maple leaf might have been a clue. Webster then recalls a copy of the Seattle Weekly, which was left sitting open on the woman's hotel room desk, which had a pressed maple leaf set on the page. Webster and others believe that this might have been a clue left behind by the woman, signifying a connection to Canada, possibly her country of origin. 
The body of the woman that called herself Mary A. Anderson was kept in the King County Medical Examiner's Office for more than eight months until she was finally embalmed and buried in a pauper section of Seattle's Crown Hill Cemetery near the neighborhood of Ballard in North Seattle. There, buried in June of 1997, she shares an unmarked grave with another person, and because of the circumstances of her death, is listed as a Jane Doe. Seattle University psychology professor Stephen Halling, as reported by journalist Todd Matthews, noted, The one thing that is most profoundly associated with suicide is hopelessness. The ritual of her death is probably not too different from how she lived her life. She is very careful, methodical. She goes to great lengths to hide how she dies. But none of us, no matter what we do, can disappear without a trace. However, as noted by Matthews in his amazing article Something About Mary, this mysterious woman managed to do just that. Nearly a quarter century has passed since Mary Anderson, or the woman calling herself that, took her own life and authorities are still unaware of who this woman was or why she made the ultimate, final decision of her life. In May of 2021, it was announced that the King County Medical Examiner's Office had teamed up with Othram Inc. to identify this woman after more than 25 years. This collaboration hopes to use advanced DNA testing and forensic genealogy to establish her identity, or at the very least, find her closest living relatives. Coincidentally, this announcement was made as I was starting research for this episode, and you can help with this crowdfunding effort by checking out the link in the show notes for the DNA Solves website. I put up $100 just a few days ago, and if this story moves you as it did me, I encourage you to pitch in a few bucks or help raise awareness in any way that you can, if at all possible. Only time will tell whether or not this collaboration will find success, but I certainly hope so. If only to bring answers to anyone in this woman's life that might be left wondering what happened to her. Until such a time, the story of Mary A. Anderson will remain unresolved. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Unresolved. As I mentioned just a moment ago, I highly encourage you all to check out the link in the show notes if you're interested in helping this case find resolution. It's not a guarantee that DNA testing and forensic genealogy will solve this case, but it's a much better bet than the alternatives. If at all possible, let's try and help this story reach a wider audience by sharing that link on our social media pages and chipping in a few bucks if you can. As I mentioned last week, I know that it's kind of been a tough year for everyone, but if you can help at all, even just sharing or spreading word, that would be great. I'm not going to take up too much of your time with the outro this week, but I just want to thank a few people really quick. Namely, I would like to thank Bethany from Milk and Murder, who, like me, is a native of Washington State and feels similarly passionate about this story. She recorded the passages that you heard earlier in this episode, and I cannot thank her enough. I would also like to thank my buddy Jesse Pollock, who you may know as one of my fellow co-hosts over at True Crime Movie Club, and you may also know as the author of The Acid King and Death on the Devil's Teeth, as well as being the filmmaker behind The Acid King documentary. He's legitimately a true crime renaissance man, and he's the one that brought this story to my attention a month or two back. Thanks Bethany, and thanks Jesse. You two absolutely rule, and I mean it when I say that this episode would not have happened without either of you. Lastly, I would like to thank the patrons that support this show through thick and thin. I'll get back to my extended outros where I thank each of you by name somewhat soon, but I would like to thank them and anyone that supported this show over the last few years, including you. 
listening right now. Thank you all so much. I'll be taking next week off as I prepare for the birth of my child, but I should be back the week after that with another new episode of Unresolved. Until then, I hope you all stay safe and stay healthy. I will talk to you later.